uh, I welcome our principal sir, Dr. Shantiranjan Pal Chaudhuri and Professor Devashish Banerjee, who is our esteemed speaker. Uh, we, we will have a brief introduction uh, for the seminar and then uh, Professor Banerjee can make his presentation. Uh, so what we will do, uh, we will uh, begin with a principal sir's deliberation. Uh, without his encouragement, this uh, lecture series would not have been a possibility. Uh, then we will ask uh, Professor Ruma Chakraborty to say a few words uh, about the seminar, about the lecture series. Uh, and then we will, uh, sir, Yes. Sir, please Am I audible? Give your deliberation. Okay. Okay. Good morning. And welcome yeah. all. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes. Good morning and welcome all at this opening ceremony of this web seminar organized jointly by the IQC and Department of English of Shamiloni Mahavidala. On the topics, today's topics is uh, uh, the humanities beyond discipline. I heartily welcome the speaker of this session, Professor Devashish Banerjee from California Institute of Integral, uh, Integral Studies, San Francisco, California. Sir, we are grateful to you sparing your valuable time from your actually time packed schedule so sir thank you sir i hope this deliberations would contribute immensely to the success of this event and share available knowledge with us his presentation would make this web seminar exciting and meaningful I wish to extend my deep appreciation to Dr. Ruma Chakraborty, IQC coordinator of our college, for her engagement to organize this webinar in this pandemic situation. I express my special thanks to the conveners, Dr. Swamrat Shengupta and Sipravel Moni for their tireless efforts to organize this webinar. So we want to share these new opportunities that are foreseeable from our expertise and get the best outcomes. I wish this web seminar be successful and reach a great uh, goal and or at a certain height. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot for your support. Uh, just uh, for the uh, audience, I just want to mention that please don't go away. If there is a technical hitch, we will definitely come back. Uh, we, are, we are doing this for the first time. So please be with us. Uh, where is uh, Professor Ruma Chakravarti? Uh, Rumadi? Yeah, Professor Ruma Chakravarti. Uh, uh, Rumadi, can you hear? Good morning. Rumadi. I warm heartedly Hello. welcome yeah, the organizers. Am I audible? Am I audible? Am I yes, audible? Yes, yes, oh, yes. Good morning. I warm heartedly welcome the organizers and participants who have joined us for the two days international lecture series on humanities beyond disciplines jointly organized by department of english and iqac of shamiloni mahavidyalaya in the modern era of science and technology the order for enrollment in humanities continues to plummet it has become increasingly important to address the relevance of studying philosophy, history, literature, 
and soft sciences like psychology and political science in tandem with study of science and technology in molding the future of society as a whole i convey my cordial greetings to the distinguished and erudite speaker professor debashish banerji uh, professor of california institutes institute of integral studies san francisco and professor anirban dash professor of cultural studies center for studies in social science kolkata who have kindly accepted our invitation to present their valuable deliberations in this lecture series i strongly believe that in the the present global crisis due to covid-19 pandemic through this new standard of e-learning process and with such invaluable topics of lecture series all the students and teachers will be benefited to a great extent i once again convey my sincere thanks to the department of english shamilani mahavidyalaya and the honorable speakers for presenting this lecture series thank you all thank you ruma di uh, professor ruma chakraborty uh, for your kind presence and deliberation uh, just uh, a few words about already ruma di has spoken a few words about the relevance of the seminar thank you. Thank you. but just to uh, speak out thank that you. yeah thank you rumadi uh, so uh, just to say a few words that uh, often humanity is read and understood disconnected from a lot of things including the discourse of science and technology which is considered as pure and unalloyed uh, as opposed to uh, the soft disciplines quote unquote soft disciplines like literature philosophy or even history or sociology where we think that science is based on facts and hard truths which are uh, impossible and we have on the other side uh, the soft uh, truths which are flexible and which are uh, for the lesser mortals like literature or philosophy but science has to go back science and technology has to go back again and again and reevaluate itself uh in order to make new formulations and uh, uh new continuations uh, and we if we see if we, if we create an engagement of technology and science with humanities then we will see that the sci- the truth about science is not as hard as uh, it has been believed rather it is rooted in the society and politics and uh, in the particular society and politics the uh, the the discourse of science can continuously question itself and transform itself into newer goals into newer objectives so with these words uh, now i will ask professor mamata sarkar who is the senior most teacher of our department uh, department of english to say a few words about professor banerji and uh, then we can go straight into his talk hello our revered guest hello our revered guest hello and and yeah all, you are audible and all, and all hello. the viewers and all the webinars so webinar I am Mamata Sharkar on behalf of Shamilani Mahavidyalaya English Department convey a very hearty welcome to you all today 24th July 2020 is the first day of this two day international online lecture series on the topic humanities beyond discipline organized by Shamilani Mahavidyalaya we know that words are powerful Humanities has been described by the Encyclopedia Britannica as a bridge to know ourselves. This definition accommodates all the attempts humans have made to know, understand, and learn 
about themselves through certain systems, processes, or structures developed into disciplines like religion, philosophy, psychology, literature, and fine art. These processes or disciplines have evolved in humanity and involve raising questions and challenging established notions, seeking answers, which sometimes come to us, sometimes don't. In our topic, Humanities Beyond Disciplines, I suppose the most incredibly audacious and human word that has been used is the word beyond, because this word reminds us of the constant need for growth, which is fundamental to our life, which keeps humans alive and makes this topic especially significant in this pandemic situation where man is mostly feeling lonely and disconnected and thus needs to look beyond. Today's literary discussion summons the archetypal non-conformist human spirit that loves to fit beyond all structures of human knowledge that we have sought to create through our culture, through the nature of our self-image. And for this, we introduce our first speaker, Professor Devashish Banerjee from California Institute of Integral Studies. Professor Banerjee is the Horida Choudhury Professor of Indian Philosophies and Cultures and the Doshi Professor of Asian Art at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He is also the program chair for the East West Psychology Department and his interests lie in postmodern, post colonial, and cross cultural approaches to Indian philosophy and psychology, culture, cultural approaches to Indian philosophy, psychology. Uh, and uh, Banerjee has edited several books on major figures of Bengal Renaissance, such as uh, the poet Rabindranath Tagore, the artist Rabindranath Tagore, and the spiritual thinker C. Aurobindo. He has also edited books on critical post-humanism and on Indian psychology. Banerjee has also curated several exhibitions on Indian and Japanese art. However, today he will deliver a lecture on reorienting a post-humanist orient on the co-constitution of humanities and technology. Sir, all of us are now eagerly waiting to hear your uh, speech. Please, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Shankar, you very much, Dr. Dr. Pasharka, Dr. Dr. Chakraborty, Dr. Chakraborty. I think, uh, and thank you very much, Shamra, for for inviting me. Uh, Shamra is a long-time collaborator uh, who has actually participated in the critical post-humanism project uh, in the book that uh, Dr. Chakrabarty uh, just mentioned. Uh, so thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, this, this discussion series. Uh, my talk is called "Reorienting a Post-Humanist Orient in the Co-Constitution of the Humanities and Technology." Uh, I will read my paper, and afterwards we can enter into a discussion. Uh, I would like first to start by unpacking my title in its terms and relations. To reorient is to orient once again. I'll come to this repetition at the end of my discussion, but to orient is to locate and direct. The term is related to the rising sun and to the east. Uh, <clears throat> it brings to mind ancient rituals of sun salutation and circumambulation but thinking of historical traces closer to our times, it reminds us of the voyages of discovery of 16th century Europe, a turning to the East, as it were, for an expansive movement of the will to knowledge, but more insidiously behind it, for the will to power, for the possession, enjoyment, and exploitation of colonialism. It reminds us of the nautical compass, an emblem of technology, 
and the journeys glorified and mythologized in the West, which were really a hunt for gold. Let us remember that Christopher Columbus went west in search of India in a ship named the Golden Hind and named the people he found Indians, a misnomer that stuck for five centuries and, in and is still in use by a large number of people today. One may thus say that the orientation of 16th century Europeans created their own orient, however they saw it. This brings us to the orient in the title and to its qualifier, post-humanist. Post-humanism is a contemporary term and refers to a historical overpassing of humanism. This is not necessarily the human, but the ism or ideology by which the human is defined. Indeed, this term can be traced in its present sense to the same orienting epoch of the 16th century, which itself was really a reorientation from its prior trajectory and a return to a previous one, hence a new birth or renaissance. The European Renaissance can be thought of synonymously with humanism as it was a reorientation from a centering in the institutionalized God of the Christian church to the discovery of the human as the source of knowledge and achievement, a return to the philosophical and cultural humanism of Hellenic or classical Greece. Aristotle's definition of the human as a unique conjunction of rational and animal souls or with the feeling function of the animal rationalized by conjunction with reason came to occupy the center of a new epoch of discovery as imaged by Leonardo da Vinci in his Vitruvian Man. Within a couple of centuries, however, this definition saw some orienting shifts by a variety of means, a major influence being the philosophy of deism, which held that God had endowed man with his own creative faculty, reason, so that he could complete the work of rationally perfecting the world that God had left unfinished. This shifted the definition of the human to a quasi-divine rationality, an ordering intelligence whose place on earth was to know the laws that made all things predictable in the image of a clockwork universe. The subordination of the sensible to the rational inaugurated one of the most foundational binaries that characterize our understanding in this human, understanding of the human in this age, the age of the enlightenment. It is with us still, which is partly why it informs our discussion of the humanities today. This shift in the idea of the human in the enlightenment cannot be overemphasized. Though the image of a clockwork universe saw a good deal of nuancing, particularly by thinkers such as Immanuel Kant, the idea of reason as the essence of the human, by the application of which both the who and the what, subject and object, would yield up their secrets and lead to a perfect world is the systemic and systematic turn constituting the epistemological project which characterizes our time ever since the Enlightenment, a project imminent in the modern knowledge academy that is ubiquitous and to which we are all yoked by dint of being born in this age. Though the form of the modern university as we know it now comes from the 19th century. Its roots are in the Renaissance and more properly the European Enlightenment. Behind it is the faith that total or absolute knowledge is the birthright and within the grasp of the human, the human of humanism, whose rationality penetrates his animality and all animality 
and all materiality to become the knower to whom the world belongs. We started with the orienting drive of the voyages of discovery and saw how their so-called epistemological nobility was a cover for the will to power as colonialism, the possession, domination, and exploitation of the non-West. This surreptitious aim of power was ubiquitous to the systematic epistemological project of the modern knowledge academy, something that has made many contemporary thinkers view colonialism as the very heart of modernity. Even in our post-colonial age, it is characterized by Jürgen Habermas as a colonization of the life world. But truly, far more pervasive, it is a geopolitics, biopolitics, and psychopolitics that unleashes an order of thanatopolitics, a binary of life and death based on who gets to be admitted into the club of the human the master of the neo-colonial, neoliberal, global, non-human world. The absolute hubris, the binaries and privileges of the modern knowledge academy are implicit from its early beginnings in its recognition of the curious imbalance between its infinite ambition and the finite lives of its workers in the choice of its systematic methods. System in the academy manifests itself in three major categories. Disciplinarity of subject categories, methodicity in research, and standards of protocol in archiving. These are meant to make sure that a body of accumulated knowledge develops that is impersonal and universal so that anyone at any time and anywhere may enter it to add or utilize it. Of these systemic devices, what concerns us particularly here is disciplinarity, the classification of subject areas into a tree structure with potentially infinite specialized leaves with the assumption of an additive integration, developing total knowledge at some vanishing point. This model brings to light the ubiquitous nature of arboretic classification in modernity, a paradigm characteristic of rational knowledge due to its ontology of non-exclusive discreteness and derivative arrangement. These two factors, A, that in a scheme, any identifiable location is unique and non-interchangeable, and B, that locations are structured according to fixed assignable ancestries, are at the very heart of the ordering mechanism of modernity. Whether we understand order in terms of knowledge or power, that is, of epistemology, the order of the world, or coloniality and governmentality, the lines of ordering populations and activities as in commanding them. The first of these two implies an identification of essences, and the second, that of priorities. The very first distinction one may think of here is between the who and the what, the subject and the object, in terms of knowledge, the humanities and the human sciences against the material sciences, earth sciences, and life sciences forming the pure sciences, and technologies forming the applied sciences. As we have seen, however, as we have seen, However, however much the pretension to knowledge of the Renaissance may have privileged the subject and the study of the humanities, philosophy and theology and the pure sciences, 
with the progress of the enlightenment the will to power as the driver of the will to knowledge became gradually more overt leading to a privileging of the sciences over the humanities and of technology over the pure sciences as the age proceeded this is particularly so in the case of the university at the turn of the 19th and 20th century with the image of the ordered field of knowledge and of society and politics having little need for it in it for the arts of a philosophy we have yet to think of the post human but let us turn to the orient as those who oriented themselves towards it did we have noted that they did so for the purposes of possession and exploitation as in colonialism but the matter is not as simple as that the enlightenment definition of the human as a rational being is not something that colonialism could shake off so easily this definition is after all extended universally to all humans and haunts the colonizing enterprise as the white man's burden this is what constituted the conflicted heart of colonialism the othering of non western populations that went hand in hand with the bestowal of universal humanity upon them it was this conflict that was capitalized by indian nationalists for example we are quite familiar with gandhi's hunger fasts and rhetoric that played upon the conscience of the british yet while colonialism lasted the white man's burden had to be accompanied with other arguments that could stop short from accepting the full humanity of the native as edward said pointed out in 1978 orientalism was one of these arguments a backhanded compliment that constructed the orient as the other of the occident contemplative spiritual imaginative and fatalistic in opposition to the rational materialistic and free willing west of course many of the orientalists were projecting a romantic critique of enlightenment modernity onto the east as its essence but in doing so they were helping to locate the orient in the arboretic classification of enlightenment racism and ethnocentrism as a different kind of and subordinate human in hobi in homi bhabha's phrase not quite not white colonialism conjured nationalism as its own inverse in the arboretic position play of the mind though it would be simplistic to see only two positions of address within colonialism there are several in between and at least one extreme the refusal of humanity apartheid for our purposes we can see how nationalism retorted with varieties of response that clustered around and polarized into a secular humanism and a religious essentialism again this is not to suggest that the early response of cultural politics in bengal that has been called the bengal renaissance can be reduced to religious essentialism or that complex leaders such as gandhi can be categorized simply in either response but these were the polar positions into which the response crystallized over time and emerged in a post colonial india today 70 years after independence we have learned that it is no longer necessary to define the human in terms of rationality and that the identity politics of religious and ethnic essentialism can be a will to rationality can can be a will to power that needs no more rationality than colonialism as its justification
to capture the science and technology to order its own mythological world. Moreover, it is neither the only nor the first to do so. Right-wing nationalism is rising undisguisedly all around us, a sign of the bankruptcy of enlightenment humanism and a form of post-humanism or perhaps alter humanism. The will to power, as with the reorientation of the voyages of discovery we started with, was never primarily interested in knowledge, except as it served the purposes of power and possession or consumption, in other words, of political hegemony and of capital. Technology, as with shipbuilding and the maritime compass, served this purpose, as did the science of administration and management. But what these applied orders of rationality served were the delirious fantasies of absolute power and enjoyment. Returning now to disciplinarity, and the last part of my title, from the early 20th century, the split between the humanities and the sciences and technologies grew increasingly into an unbridgeable gulf. Technology more and more directly the handmaiden of capital in a colonial, colonial and industrial political economy, with the humanities in a precarious position either as part of the justificatory machinery of this economy or integrated into it as its pleasure industries. Embedded within an institutional complex of publishing houses, educational institutions, museums, critics, advertising, speculation, collection, and consumption, all dependent on capital or political patronage for support, Humanities in the modern world found itself cornered, a compromised guest in a foreign territory. Its place of independence with regard to the spiritual life, the life of creative expression, of human conscience, or of the definition of the human was swept under the carpet. Philosophy reduced to natural philosophy, today better known as science. This divide between the humanities and science was recognized by C.P. Snow in his famous essay, The Two Cultures. But in that essay, he was not clear about the reasons for the peripheral and alienated place of the humanities in our times, or about what has led to the necessity of its politicization against the hegemonic regime of capital and its instrumentalization of the human. As a world phenomenon from the early 20th century, the humanities have largely rejected mainstream populations to focus on the one hand on experimental expressions of subjectivity and on the other on political responses to the dehumanization and social injustices of our times. The first of these directions, an experimental subjective precision in expression, gave a sense of renewed purpose and spiritual realism to modernism in the early decades of the last century. But the shadow of gloom that spread across the world from the Second World War on has plunged the humanities into an age of cynicism and absurdism in which a nomad politics of the periphery against the regime of capital is the only way the human spirit has kept itself alive in an isolated culture. It is almost a given in our times of pervasive cyber technology that it is technology that makes us human. An average person of our time carries a sense of superiority with respect to history due to the intuition of advanced technology which marks our time. We live in a time 
when our mediating ontology is technological, we live within a new medium, a cyber virtuality, which we take for granted, just like the air we breathe. At the same time, we are increasingly prostheticized and implanted with technology so that it exists inside and outside us. Very soon, if we go by the predictions of the transhumanists, the technological medium will have disappeared into us and we will disappear into the technological medium. Is this the fulfillment of the humanist phase, its supersession or its obsolescence? Clearly, we are at a frontier of history when the humanist image of the human, to quote Michel Foucault, is a face in the sand being swiftly erased by the incoming tide. Yet, it is nationalist ideology and consumerist technology that drive the levers affecting this erasure. It is neoliberal globalization and ideological mythology that instrumentalize us and virtualize us and our world. Their objectives profile and target us from within and without, giving us our packaged and franchised dreams and turning us into passionate subjects willing to fight for them as for ourselves. When we seem most free, we are most bound by the internalized technologies of what Shield Deleuze called the controlled societies of our time. Our critical faculty faces obsolescence in this tide and the fire that perhaps truly makes us human is no longer ours, parasited by ideology and capital. In Nietzsche's view, as expressed in Thus Spake Zarathustra, this is the image of the last man, expressing the will to nihilism, the destruction of the true forces of life. What makes us human, according to Nietzsche, is neither our rationality, nor an essence of being that distinguishes us, whether a species es essence or a racial, ethnic, or religious essence. It is the will to power over our own limitations. It is the will to becoming greater than ourselves, equal to the gods. Though it is not clear if in Nietzsche, who is so full of disdain towards Christian pity, whether this becoming greater is also a becoming larger, more inclusive, it is important for us to heed his message and apply a constructive hermeneutic to its understanding as done by Deleuze and Guattari. A will to become other applied to the global problems of our time can include a becoming minor, becoming animal, becoming earth, becoming cosmos. In heeding this message, we find that Nietzsche's definition of the human as a structure of becoming is indeed a reorientation as it comes from the mouth of an oriental, the Persian prophet, Zoroaster. A constructive hermeneutic of this kind can find a similar message for the human emanating from ancient India. In the Shatapatha Brahmana, chapter 13.6, Narayana is a seer or rishi who conceives of an aspiration of becoming all that is in the cosmos and all that is beyond the cosmos. He thus defines the scope of the human as a will to becoming that is radically infinite. In modern times, we find expression, we find this finds expression in a major figure of the Bengal Renaissance, Aurobindo Ghosh, also known as Sri Aurobindo. Quote, thought is not essential to existence nor its cause, but it is an instrument for becoming. I become what I see in myself. All that thought suggests to me, I can do. All that thought reveals in me, I can become. 
This should be man's unshakable faith in himself because God dwells in him. Unquote. This is much more than a tenet of positive thinking. It is the tenet of becoming other, not of having more or becoming or social becoming, which is only another kind of having occupying a position in a static order of being maintained by the regime of our present ontology. Becoming other implies a different kind of psychology than the rational individualism of the cogito in Descartes or Kant or the bounded ego of Freud. We have to think of other models of psychology and ontology, such as Deleuze's virtuality, or plane of imminence, or of impersonal planes of consciousness in Indian psychology with which the individual could identify. In the work of Michel Foucault, it is this will to becoming that has been stolen from the human by the state, by capital, and by religion. They implant their goals of being and having in us in the form of conscience through what Freud called the superego, or Lacan, the phallocentric figure of the father. They discipline us through technologies of surveillance, confession, and punishment on the one hand, and by the pleasure industries supported by technologies of desire production on the other. The recovery of the will to becoming is the first need of the human in our times a post-humanist redefinition or reorientation of the human. Michel Foucault sees this as a project of inverting the technologies of capital and ideology, replacing them with the subjective technologies of soul making. A post-humanist orient can contribute and participate in this need of our times through a constructive hermeneutics of the cultural archives of becoming cosmic, held, for example, in the history of Indian philosophies, psychologies, and cultures. The subjectivity of such a reorientation of the human opens up a new scope for the humanities in our place and time. And what of, te and what of technology and its stranglehold on us today? Technology as an instrument of the human domination of the cosmos has brought us to our present moment of greatest triumph, which is at the same time, our moment of greatest impotence in the face of an ecosystem we have shattered. But even as huge cracks appear on the freeways of capital, its agents, oblivious of their presence, continue to advance its integrated technologies and sophisticated systems at the service of profit-making, production, and consumption on the one hand, and political ideologies on the other. However, in a post-COVID world, the failures of our civilization will continue to grow more apparent alongside our desperate patchwork attempts to stem the tide of dystopia. New contested borderlands will appear for those who seek new definitions of the human and new relations with the world. We have already seen in the late work of Michel Foucault that the will to power turned into a will to becoming inverts the social technologies of subjection to the subjective technologies of soul making. With this inversion, we can develop a new understanding of external technologies as well, as theorized by thinkers such as Gilbert Simondon and Bernard Stiegler. Extending our technologies from the inside out, we can see our external technologies as an extended organology Contemporary media technologies are materializing human cultural history into a contemporary spatiality. Stiegler 
is particularly concerned with the archives of cultural memory that are all around us in and as technology and available to us as a tertiary form of universal memory that can be manipulated from the outside by the forces of capital and ideology, but that can, if we recover our will to becoming, be the circuits of long-term memory shared, reinterpreted, and participated in by communities of collective transindividuation, building the polis of another kind of post-humanist future. Transindividuation is not a collection of individuals bound by a social contract and governed from above by laws. It is not even intersubjectivity. It is a will to conscious collective individuality, a braiding of individuations into a collective individual conscious of itself in all its individuals. Such communities imply a different political economy, one of fraternal anarchism. A participatory community of this kind with porous goals of becoming can be constituted by shared genealogies of collective memory materialized by technologies and interpreted by the humanities. Technology seen in this light is no longer an alienated antagonist of the humanities, not even a form in which the humanities can reside as content, but as co-constituents of our collective ontology, or rather ontogenesis, as psychologically part of us and as instrumental to our humanities as our personal memory, perpetually stored and perpetually reinterpreted in our collective participation in a transindividuating cosmogenesis. Thank you. Thank you, Devashishda. Uh, Pavel, please, uh, can you make us visible? Yeah. Uh, Pavel, are you there? Please make us visible. Uh, thank you, Devashishda. Uh, like, there are uh, one or two questions, but I want to ask you some things. Uh, we can start. Uh, yeah, Pavel, are you there? Please, can you make us visible, all of us? Yeah. Uh, like I have some questions for you, uh, like certain queries, certain clarifications. Uh, first is, uh, since you talked about science and technology, uh, you know, within the discourse of science itself, there is this dialectics of knowing and unknowability at work. Yes. The dialectics of yes. dialectics of knowing and unknowability is within the discourse of science, and uh, but it is we humans who have reduced these dialectics of, uh, like dialectics within the science into a kind of scientism, which essentializes uh, scientific knowledge and fetishizes scientific knowledge as an absolute truth. I, I like to, I want to ask this question that how this uh, very uh, fetishization of science as hard truth, as absolute truth, uh, is connected with the fetish of the digital and the capitalist fetishization of science and technology in the modern world. So that is one question. You can, you can. What do you, what do you like? Like, uh, should I ask two, three questions and then yeah. to respond? Yeah, yeah. Please, 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 ask yeah. Please, please ask two, three questions. Yeah. Uh, so another, another uh, question is, um, like, uh, do you think that this post-human future, uh, though you have already partly answered this question, still I uh, would like to ask that, do you think the roots of this post-human future? Uh, which we are seeing now, existed as the alienated other of the human in humanism. 
uh, that is another question and what do you think this is a very this is something which interests me a lot uh, what do you think you talked about control society so i want to ask you like like what what is what do you think about the control of the algorithm today like i was uh, like uh, sharing uh, the posters of this seminar repeatedly and uh, someone asked me that you know, why are you sharing the same thing again and again so i said okay you know this is all about algorithm uh, this is the same re- same way that the you know right wing it cells they work you know they share the same thing again and again and it continuously comes in your news feed so i am trying to use that in a positive purpose so that people can uh, know about this lecture and listen so what is the control of algorithm you talked about psycho uh, psychopolitics and connect, connected to this psychopolitics is this politics of algorithm which is affecting our uh, idea of truth and reality in a certain sense and also uh, it is pertinent in a world of what we call post truth these are some of the questions and then i can ask one or two question from the audience response please yes samrat uh, yes, absolutely samrat. Very, uh, absolutely very, very pertinent question very pertinent questions um i think uh, i think uh, i think uh, i think uh, you might your mic your mic ha ha yes so uh, your first question about uh, the discourse of knowability and unknowability within within science itself it's very true and philosophy of science has dealt with that that is the way in which science has developed as a discourse but also you are absolutely right and that has actually happened due to the privileging of technology we come back to the whole idea of the will to knowledge and the will to power the will to power drives the will to knowledge and actually creates this alienated fetish objects of technology technology becomes fetishized because the libido is really captured through this idea of uh, a certain kind of a bounded knowledge knowledge which is true the the truth knowledge of science and that becomes attached or associated with technology technology drives that notion that what we are being given is the truth so that that particular reified knowledge is really what we receive as uh, the kind of uh, uh, you know illusion uh, of of our reality you see so th- that in a sense is uh, how we lead our lives how we are made to lead our lives r- rather than entering into the discourse of uh, science as a philosophy that is a, a, a that is related to the will to knowledge so i think it's really this uh, you know separation of the will to knowledge and the will to power in our times that has led to this uh, this this uh, ontology uh, of our of social ontology of our times uh the other question that you had about post humanism as being the other of the human is is also absolutely true that is uh, that uh, in a way humanism defines the human again like that in a discourse that shifts and in that shifting it is othering its own other possibilities and at the same time those possibilities live within it and become into a transhumanism it become becomes into a a a, a privileging of the technological posthuman you see but at the same time we have the other subjugated discourses of uh, of of knowledge within uh, within humanism which is what foucault is talking about he calls it the insurrection of subjugated knowledge and that is really the subjugation of humanism which returns as a uh, post humanism in our times uh finally your question related to uh, algorithm or uh, the uh, control societies actually control societies are largely dependent on algorithms the algorithms are driving us driving us from outside as well as from inside and we are subject to them so that even when we think we are free that is what is controlling our thoughts uh 
and what you were saying about the inversion of algorithmic life which is that you know when i'm talking about a kind of an inversion of uh, humanism into a post humanism of becoming uh, even such a post humanism of becoming has to be in relation with the with the ontology of our times and therefore it has to utilize the same tropes of that ontology to find its you know economic foothold and as you were saying you have to utilize the algorithmic uh, nature of uh, you know uh, of the machine that uh, the, the technology whose ontology we live in so i think uh, this is this is the way in which controlled societies work we need to be conscious of it but we can also use it to beneficial purpose for the politics of uh, our times uh, thank you devashish da uh, another interesting question i think it will be very relevant to your talk because you know you talked about a uh, certain kind of uh, technological over determination to be uh, overhauled and overcome by a resurgence of the minor knowledges which can uh, effectively come through technology in a certain way and you talked about another kind of the post post, post human possibilities where we are also a part of the life world I, I i thank you for using this word life world i was reading uh, derida's take on life world a few days back uh, and uh, this uh, but i was just asking you this idea of the infinite to which man is implicated and man's ability to connect with the uh, infinite which you referred to bengal renaissance figure like aurobindo and maybe tagore also in certain sense rabindranath uh i was asking you how this infinite is appropriated in certain ways uh in in a certain discourse of technology because technology offers you a certain kind of false infinite where everything is flattened all knowledge is appropriated and absorbed into a certain kind of uh, false i i would say still pseudo singularity and this what the problem with this is that a connected question is that how this opens us up to a certain kind of uh, continuous fulfillment of the desire for the infinite through a certain consumerist capitalist technology and on the other hand exposing you to a certain kind of precarity because you know that all your individuation is erased by a grand representation of infinite infinite to which you cannot connect but rather which connects to you uh, so this dialectics of precarity and consumerism and the kind of myth of the technological infinite uh, is in certain sense also responsible for the rise of the right wing politics so how you address this thank you yes uh, samrat that is i think extremely uh, uh you know penetrating analysis very very true and it's exactly uh, what we are in the middle of the fact of this uh, uh you know displacement of the infinite the displacement of the infinite into the flattened technological consumerism of our times and also in a way to the discourse of the transhuman the transhuman uh, offers us another kind of infinite which is also a type of uh, a uh, surrogate flattening uh, because again we come back to the whole idea of the will to power which has uh, become in a way which has been stolen from us which has become externalized through these uh, ontologies that govern us and control us and it is really a inversion of that and only an inversion of that stigler talks about how the libido has been really uh, you know uh, i mean uh, dis de destroyed by this kind of a false infinite instead of which he's talking about the infinite sublimation of the lib libido in forming goals of becoming which are infinite 
And so it's this inversion that is necessary. And until we understand that, we will be subject to it. And this is what is happening all around us. We are being subject to it and we are falling into uh, easy subjection because in a way we are thinking that something infinite is being given to us. So it's, it's a real, uh, you know, it's a trap. And the trap can only be uh, you know, understood and, and uh, addressed by an inversion where the inversion goes towards a goal of becoming rather than the goal of having and of occupying social positions. Uh, thank you. Now I will ask, I think we have five, seven minutes for questions. So uh, before we start with Anirvanda, uh, like uh, I just, because we started late also, uh, I just re read some of the questions. Pavel, can you please highlight just uh, the questions? Uh, I can read it from the last question. That will be beneficial for you. I'll read the last question first, and then we can proceed. Uh, like two, three questions, so, so that Devashishda can see it on the screen as well. The last question by uh, Ashok Mahapatro, Professor Ashok Mahapatro. He teaches at Chambalpur University and very interested in posthumanism. The uh, uh, avid reader of posthumanism also. He has asked a question: uh, How would you react uh, to the concept of infin infinity as postulated by Levinas? who wanted to develop an alternative ontology. So uh, I'm not familiar with the concept. I'm not so familiar with the concept of infinity as postulated by Levinas, who was, uh, you know, an ethical thinker. I'm not uh, that uh, aware of his uh, concept of infinity. I'm sorry. So I don't think I, I think I'll bypass that question. Uh, thank you, Devashishda. I think Ashokda can later on engage uh, with sure. you with this question. Uh, sure. uh, Alicia Gonzalez, she has asked a question. Is there, uh, is there a way for the humanities to actualize the will to power over their current limitations, peripheral orientations to spar post-humanism? Uh, what would that look like? Uh, yes, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, yes, I believe, uh, indeed, uh, I, believe, uh, I believe that is possible, and uh, I believe that is possible. what the role of the humanities today can be, and that's what I said about the fact that the humanities can really promote this idea of becoming, the idea of uh, you know the literatures of becoming, the cultures of becoming, and the cultures of actually. Uh, you know, today in the arts, for example, we don't think about metaphors as much as metonyms now. In other words, how do we construct our history in an interpretive sense? How do we become, uh, you know, willing subjects that are actually finding a path for ourselves, a genealogy for ourselves in a material way, in our connection with history? So the ability to allow people to engage with histories in the sense of developing genealogies of becoming is something that the uh, humanities can promote. Thank you. Thank you, Devashida. Next question is, uh, I am not sure about it, but then uh, where do you see the relevance of hierarchy with respect to the split? Not so much the power, but who wills it? Uh, I am not sure what uh, the speaker. Yeah, I believe she is yeah. talking about uh, the hierarchy between uh, between the science uh, between between the humanities and the technologies, and the question of uh, who wields the power. So that that is that, that that's a very pertinent issue, and that really it sets us up for a kind of system where there's a scramble for power. The will to power really is a will to control. And the hierarchy between technology and, 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 uh, you know, and humanities really sets us up for a competitive uh, you know, sort of system 
where everybody is trying to get hold of those levers of power. And that uh, completely, it, it's a, we are in a war situation because of that. We are, this, is, this is the nature of the uh, universal war in which we find ourselves. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there is a question. I want to ask this question. Just scroll up. Uh, Pavel, you will see a question by Shopna Rai. Uh, I think she is the first one to ask you a question. Uh, uh, this, I think, will because this is connected with Indian philosophy. I want to ask it first. Uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think of artificial consciousness, AI, in context? to the transcendental theory of consciousness of Advaita Vedanta? Uh, this question. Uh, well, uh, artificial consciousness, or AI, is we are going back to things like transhumanism. Uh, uh, in transhumanism, artificial consciousness, there is the notion that to some extent, machine consciousness can arrive at human consciousness. Uh, today, we don't really view it fully like that. We view it more in terms of artificial consciousness as, you know, implanted replacement, implanted replacement. In other words, all. Hello, it's getting interrupted. Hello. Yeah, I don't know what is the problem. Hello. Hello. Pavel, please sw uh, switch off everybody's mic except Devashishda. Let's see if we can listen. I know I'm not sure. I think Professor Banerjee has left. Oh, uh, there must be some problem. Just let, let us wait for some time. Some technical glitches might be. Some technical glitches. Might be. Ah, some technical glitches. Maybe he has left. Let me see the messenger. I hope he will rejoin uh, because let us wait for a couple of minutes because I think he will rejoin. Uh, I don't know what is going to happen. Like, uh, Professor Banerjee, Professor ben Banerjee got disconnected, na? And he has left somehow. Uh, uh. So, you can wait for it. Then we can start. Hello, ah, can you hear coming me? Back. Right, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, there was, there was some problem. So, you just left. Thank you, thank you for coming back. Please. Okay. Uh, continue this, with your this question is, uh, question is, uh, you know, artificial consciousness in context to transcendental theory of consciousness of Advaita Vedanta, the artificial theory or artificial intelligence really belongs to the notion of transhumanism. In a philosophical sense, I'd say these are two extremes. One extreme, both extremes are not of much concern to a post-humanist ethic. Because on the one hand, you are lost in the machine. And on the other hand, you're lost in the infinite or in the transcendental. The transcendental has no, no, no interest in us. And the, the machine, in the machine, we lose ourselves. So both these extremes 
are in a sense, uh, you know, it's not even a post-humanism, it's an extra humanism. So that is not really uh, what concerns us in this particular discussion. Uh, thank you, Devashishda. Uh, I will not ask further questions. There are many more. Uh, but I will request if Anirbanda has anything uh, to ask to you. Uh, Anirbanda, Dr. Anirbanda Das uh, is uh, as Associate Professor, Center for Studies in Social Sciences, our next speaker. Uh, do you have anything to ask to Devashishda? You can. Uh, not at the moment. Like maybe. Uh, not at the moment. Many it is nice to see you after a long It's nice to see and hear you. Yeah. Okay, then uh, can I ask one last? Can I ask one uh, last question? Like uh, this is connected with uh, uh, like semiotics. Uh, Professor Oriktam Chatterjee, uh, uh, he 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 has asked, sir, do you think semiotics holds the key? for charting the field of post-humanist communication between humankind and technology? Like to answer this? Yes, I will. Semiotics? I think, okay, yes, semiotics. Will. semiotics is the study of signification systems. And signification systems can help us up to a certain point. But I think, you know, as Deleuze points out, there is another kind of understanding of semiology which has to do with signs that are not yet signified. You see, in our ability to communicate with, let's say, non-human, uh, you know, we have to depend on something which is not yet a signification system. Therefore, semiotics, as we understand, it only goes up to a certain point. Beyond that, we have to develop another kind of understanding of sign. The sign that, in a sense, signals that the ideas that are not yet manifest. You see, we have to open to that kind of a sign uh, understanding, uh, which is really the domain of the post-human. I don't think that semiotics as we understand it now uh, holds the key for charting the field of post-human communication between the human and technology. I think, that, I think we have to go beyond semiotics. Thank you, Devashishda. Thank you, Devashishda. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it was really an enlightening uh, discussion and uh, talk. And uh, I'm grateful to you. I learned a lot. And uh, it was a very lively session. So, uh, Pavel, can you please introduce, first of all, uh, uh, let me thank Onirvanda for joining us. And uh, uh, Professor Onirvanda uh, is uh, teaches at uh, Center for Studies in Social Sciences. And more than that, uh, he is my guide. Uh, whatever a little I've learned, I've learned from uh, Anirvanda. And of, of course, I learn every day from Devashida as well, because uh, with, from his writings, from his uh, online lectures, because I don't meet him frequently. And Anirvanda is uh, uh, virtually, physically, and on, on phone, always present to guide me and uh, uh, engage and uh, like encourage me. So I welcome Anirbanda. Uh, uh, now uh, my colleague, Pavel Muni uh, is my departmental colleague, my junior, a very bright man who, who is handling the technicalities of today's session. He can just introduce Anirbanda uh, and then Anirbanda can uh, deliver his talk. Well, uh, thank you, Shomlarda. So first, I would like to thank Mr. Anirban Das for accepting our invitation to this online lecture series. Mm, the Department of English, Shomirani Mohabiddaloy, welcomes you to its virtual platform. We would like you to know that we are honored to host you. And now for the audience, those who are watching this program live on YouTube. Thank you, thank you very much. Your support certainly encourages us for our future ventures. 
now let me introduce mr anirban dash to you uh, mr dash is an associate professor of cultural studies at center for studies in social sciences calcutta he did his graduation in medicine yes uh, you have heard it right he was a student of medical science and then he shifted to the interdisciplinary space of the humanities and the social sciences and then he did his phd in philosophy he has publications in both english and bengali on feminist theory deconstruction post colonial theory the body science studies and medical <coughs> epistemology his academic monograph toward a politics of the impossible the body in the third world feminisms has been published by the anthem press he is currently working on three book projects and a number of essays today he will be speaking on non slash relations othering in the field of the sciences now i request mr dash to take over thank you thank you thank you very much um, i'm really honored and and very very happy uh, to to try to say something uh, to have got this uh, offer from uh, shamrat who is a very dear friend uh, and pavel and the shamiloni uh, mohammedalai uh, who have thought of this uh, really uh, fascinating title uh, for for uh, their lecture series uh, and uh, i i i am really happy that that something like this is happening uh, and and really happy to to uh, make a small contribution to this so so let us uh, uh, and and also i i should say uh, that uh, humanities across disciplines that is a very vital uh, very uh, absolutely necessary thing to think about uh, in these times uh, in these times when humanities itself is is uh, as we all know uh, under attacks on various counts uh, the spirit of humanities the spirit uh which which uh, which distinguishes humanities from from certain other kinds of disciplines that has been under attack severely uh, intensively uh, almost throughout the globe uh, so it's it's really necessary to think of humanities uh, in its relations to other disciplines uh, especially uh in in both uh, today's uh, devashista's talk and uh, i'll also try to think of it in terms of uh, the relationships of humanities uh, with the sciences in in a certain way and just to be very clear uh, like after this um, extremely rich extremely variegated uh, nuanced discussion uh, by devashista uh, like i would try to think of some very elementary things uh, uh, almost almost uh, like uh, starkly simple uh, and try to make only uh, one or two points uh, that might interest uh, the, the people who are listening to this discussion uh, so so i i move on to uh, what 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 i want to talk about uh, as as uh, patel has already told like uh, the, uh, the the title uh, today is for me is non stroke relations uh, othering in the field of the sciences um, I'll, I'll i'll try to think of uh, a, a certain uh, structural and logical dynamic Uh, in the uh, relationship uh, relationships uh, with uh, which uh, like the sciences uh, try to build their hegemony in the disciplinary fields uh, uh, and how these relations uh, are in some sense non relations as well 
uh, if I have, um, as, as is evident from the title, uh, othering happens in a certain way. And to think beyond the sciences uh, in the domain of knowledge, to think in terms of the humanities in the domain of knowledge uh, is to think of a dynamic of othering uh, which is different from a dynamic of othering through which the sciences work. That would be uh, the, the, the basic uh, point maybe which, which uh, I'll, I'll try to talk about. Mm. And it will like uh, to, to put it very simply, uh, the my my argument will will revolve around like two sets of uh, of uh, names, two sets of words. Uh, one would be like to put it very very uh, very succinctly, very very uh, in in uh, an elementary way the. Uh, the distinctions between uh, as if and perhaps. I, I take it from uh, uh, one uh, very important essay uh, by Jacques Derrida, uh, The University Without Condition, uh, where um, like among, among again, like a number of different uh, things uh, about which Derrida is talking about there, um, I, I see like this uh, dynamic uh, working in very insidious ways uh, and also in uh, sometimes in explicit ways, these distinctions between what one might call uh, as if and what one might call perhaps. Uh, as would be evident, uh, like in both of these, uh, there is a certain sense of uh, making up, a certain sense of, uh, uh, real, uh, which may not be uh, fully real, uh, like, but in the making up of this not fully reality, not fully real, uh, there is a slight difference, uh, the way in which the notion of as if produces the real, and the notion of perhaps uh, engages with the real, there is a slight difference. And within that uh, distinction, I, I will try to place uh, my argument uh, regarding the distinction between uh, the humanities and the sciences, the relationships between the humanities and the sciences, uh, and the non-relations between the humanities and the sciences. And also two other terms, uh, would be uh, important here, uh, those terms, uh, notion of the unconditional and the notion of the sovereign. Mm, these are also there in, in that essay by the reader. Uh, but before going into that, uh, before going into um, these, um, uh, these very uh, important and interesting uh, distinctions of which which mark uh, my argument today. I'll, I'll, I'll try to talk about uh, two other moments. One again is a very uh, well-known moment in, in, in uh, anyone who, who uh, thinks about science in its relations with the others. Uh, anyone who is uh, like more or less a uh, uh, like uh, thinking in terms of disciplines, uh, try to think in terms of disciplines, and then which like a num hundreds of essays maybe and a number of books have been written on this, uh, which is the Sokal affair. Mm. I'll, I'll begin with that. Uh, then I'll try to think of um, one moment uh, of um, thinking about science in its relation to others, uh, the moment where uh, uh, Weber thinks it in terms of disenchantment um, and uh, a certain uh, a feminist rereading of that moment. And then I uh, move on to the, the uh, humanities, science 
and the university uh, at the end of the essay. Uh, so uh, the Sokal affair, as, as uh, most of us definitely already know, uh, but maybe for the students, it, it might uh, be helpful if we recall the uh, bare uh, uh, lineaments of, of what happened. Uh, it was in 1996, as we all know, uh, Alan Sokal, uh, a physicist, uh, a left-leaning physicist, uh, uh, brought out an essay uh, in uh, a very uh, important uh, journal uh, uh, called uh, 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 Important and like one of the leading journals of the time. Uh, social text, um, an essay which which uh, dealt with, uh, I think uh, it will be interesting uh, to to just uh, 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 which which dealt with the uh, a sort of what one Anirvanda. Uh, Anirvanda. Uh, 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 just be, uh, can you be a bit louder? Because many people are saying that uh, the sound is this. Ekto jore bolo ba do something about just a bit interrupt them. Sorry. Acha acha. Which actor? Oh, is is the sound? Oh, is is the sound? I but audience is it better now? I I I I I I I I I like the name of this essay would be like self-explanatory in a way. Uh, it was called uh, Transgressing the Boundaries uh, Toward a Transformative Hermeneutics of Quantum Gravity. Uh, so in a way, uh, this would be a, what one may very loosely call a sort of a postmodern uh, take on the sciences um, and which talked about uh, how uh, the notion of quantum gravity uh, uh, would uh, be thought of in in terms of uh, in terms of uh, like the new theoretical uh, mechanisms uh, that were going on in in, in that period. Um, so so this uh, essay was published in social text. Uh, just within a few months, uh, Alan Sokal came up with a smaller essay uh, in a different uh, uh, journal uh, saying that this essay uh, was a hoax. And, and, and this has been uh, initiated, this has initiated the uh, like turbulent debate around the uh, sciences, uh, which, which uh, has been uh, then known as the uh, affair of the like so-called hoax, and very interestingly, uh, that uh, issue of uh, social text was itself called the science wars, an issue on the science wars, um, which which seemed to which which claimed to deal with the war uh, around the notion of science, uh, which uh, has been. Uh, uh, like uh, been there uh, for for uh, quite some time then uh, around uh, how to think about science, how to think about the claims to reality and the claims to uh, truth uh, in science. Uh, so what Sokal told, you know, uh, came up with in his later essay that uh, he said that like, uh, what he said in that essay was was bogus. Uh, it was uh, wrong in in different ways. But what he had done 
was he had uh, used uh, the jargon that were um, operative in, in the then uh, humanities and social sciences uh, disciplines uh, to and and put them in 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 uh, very very cleverly uh, so that uh, people were hoodwinked into publishing this essay in a in a uh, quite reputed journal and for Sokal uh, it showed the shoddiness of uh, scholarship uh, in in the humanities uh, that was uh, re relevant that was uh, uh, like operating at the point of time <clears throat> so it's not a very uh, important event uh, practically like uh, many people have, have talked about uh, later on uh, around around uh, notions of what these main for uh, Sokal's own uh, credibility, what this meant for like, and and like the journal editors themselves came up with a, a response to this, where, where they told uh, that uh, like this article was referred back to the author a number of times, um, but then he persisted with, with uh, what he said. And finally, they came up with uh, uh, in publishing. They said uh, uh, there is a huge debate around this. Uh, I will, I will really not go into that um, here today. Uh, it's quite well known by now. What I will try to think of is only about one or two things which uh, this might. Uh, this whole affair uh, might uh, uh, signify for for uh, the difference between uh, the sciences and the humanities, uh, the way in which, uh, uh, like, quote unquote, the scientists would uh, think of the whole field of knowledge. And uh, also uh, some points about about uh, and and I, I'll not go into those uh, like what the humanities should the the necessary thinking and rethinking on the part of the humanities which which this uh, should uh, imply. Uh, but but the point that I want to think about here is. Very interestingly, uh, and then Sokal also uh, came up with a book along with uh, another um, uh, scholar, uh, Jean Picmo, uh, and this book uh, was called, like the English translation was called Fashionable Nonsense, uh, uh, Postmodern Intellectuals uh, Abuse of Science. Uh, and and it's it's quite evident, like uh, what what it tries to say. Uh, but very interestingly, what uh, is done there by Sokal is he tries to show how uh, different uh, theoreticians like like uh, like Deleuze or Irigere or 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 uh, Kristeva, um, Derrida to a, to some extent. Uh, how they were using uh, terms uh, coming from science, uh, according to Sokal, uh, in order to like use the authority of science uh, to to boost their own claims, uh, but not really uh, understanding or uh, going into uh, the very specific meanings in which uh, these words were being used in uh, the sciences. Uh, I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, talk about only two things here. One, let us remember uh, the way in which, say, a uh, uh, scientific journal differs from, say, a journal in the humanities and social sciences in deciding upon uh, which papers to publish. For the sciences. Uh, the 
important point probably would be like whether what the paper says is right or wrong, is correct or incorrect. Uh, for these other disciplines, on the other hand, uh, rather than the question of correctness or incorrectness, what might be important uh, would be the way the argument is built up, the whether certain very interesting points are raised, which may or may not be correct in, in the scientific sense, and yet uh, thus uh, may call for publication. So uh, this, the, the debate around this uh, thing, uh, maybe not the uh, event itself, but the debate around this event showed the differences uh, between these, these two ways of uh, thinking about uh, what is good scholarship. So it's not to say that there is nothing called correct or incorrect in the humanities. It's, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, what I'm saying is that uh, what makes uh, an intervention important is not only the correctness of the facts. So that is one point uh, which, uh, in a certain way, like so called mixed, uh, mixed, I think, uh, uh, but also the necessity uh, on the part of the humanities uh, scholars to, to maintain a certain rigor in, in, in the in the in the uh, arguments uh, that is also like like it's it's uh, something like where uh, both sides loses it's it's not that one side wins against the other uh, and the other thing which which is uh, a little more clear in Sokal's book is the way he thinks of when he thinks of a word uh, he thinks of the meaning of the word uh, in the context of science uh, and is almost oblivious uh, in how the same word uh, might be used in different ways in a different context. Uh, so uh, like, like I, 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 I uh, often, often I, I talk about this, uh, say uh, the, the notion of uh, the topos, the notion of the topos in topology, uh, scientific discipline, the uh, discipline in mathematics, geometry, and the notion of the topos in, say, uh, rhetoric. They're completely different. Uh, one might open oneself up to these differences in enunciation, or one might think uh, one of these uh, meanings to be the correct one, and the others to be the wrong ones. So Sokal, I would I would say, uh, like goes for the latter. He, he thinks the uh, meaning of the word in the scientific context to be the uh, only possible meaning, while the others are incorrect. Uh, but uh, this also is something which is missed often. Uh, on the part of, uh, quote-unquote, the sciences. So, uh, when one thinks of the hegemony of science in the uh, field of disciplines, in the field of knowledge, uh, these are some of the very small, very uh, almost negligible uh, but very important points through which uh, these hegemony works, I would, I would, I would say. Um, and now, uh, just, just I'll, I'll, I'll keep this hanging. I'll come back to this discussion uh, at the end of my talk. Mm, uh, and now uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go into a uh, uh, discussion of one moment uh, in the in the uh, thinking about science, uh, where uh, one 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 tries to think about 
the relation between science and non-science. So uh, so-called affair being one moment where the relation between science and non-science is being thought of in a certain way uh, on the part of the sciences, mm, there will be a mirroring of this on the part of the quote-unquote non-sciences as well. I, I, I didn't talk about those. Mm, but now I, I, I move on to a very quick discussion on uh, the uh, on the problem of locating the break between science and non-science. Uh, so science, in a way, has been the defining moment uh, of the secular modern. Uh, uh, one may argue with the centrality that's accorded to science, but no one prob probably would contest the import of science as one of the central elements of modernity. The break from the sacred often appears as the event of the emergence of science uh, from the structures of prior forms of knowledge. Yet this appearance has its antecedents and the break also has its continuities. Uh, so uh, through references to mainly Max Weber, um, I, I try to think of how the ruptures and connections uh, are thought of in, in a very particular way. Uh, and uh, I also uh, move into a discussion by Evelyn Fox Keller uh, in a, in a uh, certain way about, about this distinction. Uh, for Weber, the operative word that distinguishes science from the sacred is disenchantment. Not that disenchantment as an element of civilization in the West was earlier absent. On the contrary, it was there for thousands of years. What happens is now it becomes the central defining element of man's vocation. This is according to Weber. Science as vocation does not imply a focus on its efficacy in practical and technical matters, the attainment of practical technological aims, nor does it imply the use of science to reach true being, art, true nature, true God, or true happiness. These earlier illusions are in a way removed. Uh, these are not the vocation of the scientist. The vocation is something like science for science's sake. The interesting point is that science is associated with the idea of progress. The idea of fulfillment is different for art and science. Every achievement in science is to be surpassed within years. So the question, why try to attain something that will inevitably be dated very soon? The preconceptions of science as a vocation, as Weber sees them, belong to two orders. The evident ones are the rules of logic and method operative in the workings of science. The hidden one is the principle that productions of scientific work are worth knowing. But this proposition about science's inherent worth cannot be scientifically established. This needs something akin to what animates the artist, like inspiration. Passion for Weber is the precondition for inspiration. The right thing to occur to the individual cannot be forced, cannot follow only from the calculations. Calculation is a prerequisite of this occurrence, necessary but not sufficient. Again, this inspiration is not derived from any practical aims that science leads to. A scientist lecturer is not a demagogue or a prophet. Disenchantment of, for the, of the world for Weber is the knowledge or the belief that if one wanted to, one could find out any time that there are, in principle, no mysterious, incalculable powers at work. One could, in principle, master everything through calculation. This, more than anything, is intellectualization as such. Weber discusses the possible claims of theology as science. He calls it the intellectual rationalization of the position of what is sacred. But theology is not only rationalization. It also involves a quote-unquote sacrifice of the intellect in the sense of accepting certain propositions to be beyond the reach of knowledge. 
These are different from the preconceptions of science. Science retains the element of decision in choosing its preconception. For theology, the choice is given, not decided upon. The religions provide a morality, a dignity. This is replaced in the disenchanted world by the dignity of man, by the sense of responsibility of evil. Polytheism of religions is thus replaced by rationalizing of ethical, methodical conduct of life, by the invocation of the calculated conduct of one that is necessary. Science for the main at the threshold of modernity was a way to God, ways to find meanings that lay hidden in God's intentions. Today, science is irreligious, not the way to God. The intellectualist romanticism of the irrational today, Weber says, is to reach out to the sphere of the irrational with reason to make it reasonable. It is interesting to repeat that the passion for science, thus underivable from scientific calculations, is a passion for the disenchantment that science implies. The passion for science is not a rational scientific impulse. The answer to the question, why one does science, is not a scientific answer. Yet the vocation of science grounded upon the impulse to do science has its own rational form. The control of things through calculation and clarity, production of internally meaningful conclusions are parts of this impulse. So, so this is uh, to, to, to uh, like summarize very, very uh, reductively perhaps uh, what, what Weber is trying to think about uh, disenchantment, disenchantment in, in, in uh, thinking about science. Evelyn Foxkiller deals with the gendering of disenchantment. She approaches the problem through the question of the secret. For Weber, disenchantment had been the belief that one could, in principle, master everything through calculation. Disenchantment is a possibility of the final doing away of the secrets and of incalculability. For Fox Keller, the change in the meaning of secret and the relations to the secret are at the heart of the scientific revolution and the purported progress in science. She goes into the lineages of secrets of God, secrets of nature, secrets of life, and secrets of death. In the enchanted view, secrets belong to God. Secrets are by definition unknown, not for human understanding. <clears throat> knowledge had potentially been truncated and fearful. In other words, knowledge had been respectful to the unknown, to non-knowledge. Yet this respect was articulated in the language of interdiction. This enchantment shifts the referent of the secret from God to nature. Here, what is not known is to be forcefully brought into the realm of the known. Weber spoke of disenchantment as a belief that, in principle, one can master everything through calculation. If secrets of God were uninfringible, secrets of nature became tantalizing invitations to violate, a call to transgress, not an ethics of respect to the unknown, became the guiding principle of knowledge. Fox Keller juxtaposes, uh, very interestingly, the relationship between God stroke nature to that between man stroke woman. A shift of focus to the secrets of nature that invite and incite penetration by knowledge is premised upon an equation between nature and woman. Here, man becomes godly. In the enchanted world, man could not reach out to the secrets that belong to God. With disenchantment, man with a capital M takes over certain attributes of God, most importantly, the limitlessness of his reach. Man had already occupied a special place in God's world, arriving on the seventh day of creation. Now the secrets belong to the womanly nature. Man who is now godly is not the reservoir of secrets. He is the opposite, the hunter for knowledge that potentially wins over the secrets. Woman and the world of objects remains the passive bearer of man's action. Uh, Fox Keller describes the moment when the secrets of life, the traditional bastion of the woman hitherto inaccessible to man, opened up to man's scientific scrutiny. 
molecular biology led to the discovery of the double helical structure of the DNA molecule, the key to genetic transmission. The secret that was thus being revealed was hardly the secret of the living human. Molecules had replaced the human. The secret of human birth was reduced to the secret of molecular replication. Uh, we might remember here that in a, an earlier essay, Donna Haraway had already argued convincingly that sexual reproduction always takes two, and neither parent is continued in the child. The child remains, uh, I quote, a randomly reassembled genetic package, unquote. Yet the discourse on genetic transmission stressed continuity. This focus on continuity is made possible by moving the infinite possibilities of shifts in the ever-changing living body to the background. In the shift from the flesh to the molecules, Fox Killer sees the production of a condition she calls lifeless. She relates this to the invention of weapons of mass destruction in the form of the atom bomb and its successors. This, she says, is the displacement of flesh and blood reference of life itself. Generation or creation and destruction refer as if only to lifeless objects like the molecules or the targets. I quote, it is with the move away from the life itself that the enormous gap between the production of lifeless devivified forms and the production of life destroying devivifying forms achieves a curious kind of closure, unquote. The meaning of the word secret shifts from secrets of God to secrets of nature to secrets of life and secrets of death. In the process, nature, woman, and a host of other others to the modern scientific self are excluded. Life and death refer only to the dynamic of molecules and of impersonal targets. Death may not one very tentatively question this neat binary between life and molecules, Positing the question of sexism squarely in the workings of science, should one not interrogate also the naturalized notion of life that this binary presupposes? Are molecules mere artifacts? Are bombs just instruments? Haraway has been acute enough to treat men and non-men, animals and objects as material semiotic actors. And we all know like a host of uh, uh, critics. Uh, Latour maybe like has tried to work across the subject object binary through the notion of quasi objects. A questioning may not always ignore or abandon what one questions. Interrogating the subject object, culture, nature, man, animal, and innumerable other binaries is associated with a questioning of the break between science and the sacred. Yet interrogation may accompany association. Uh, one may be suspicious of the neat division between the act of division and that of blurring of divisions. One then is to hold on to both ends of a binary to question divisions while holding on to them. Breaks and neat binaries are the prerequisites of moderns which, as Latour argues, barely work in the modern world. Before going back, say, like to the Implications of these questions in the context of scientific notions of life and molecules, one may go back to the ways in which these interrogations had been produced in the discourses around science. So, like, it's one way in which, uh, uh, like, like, science uh, may be thought of in terms of a disenchantment, uh, which in a certain way of thinking about science, uh, uh, one, one, one uh, uh, clearly demarcates uh, the science from non-science. And yet, in a certain way, this is a forgetting of the uh, inherent relations between science and non-science uh, that, that continue to operate. So now, uh, I, 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 I come to, to uh, the question of, and, and I will uh, end, end with this discussion, uh, the question of the humanities, the sciences, and the university. 
so I, 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 I um, read in a certain way. Uh, no, uh, probably uh, we don't have enough time to, to go into uh, very details of this discussion, but maybe I, I, I'll try to read this from, from again, uh, that there is a small but very interesting, very important and evocative essay, The University Without Condition. So, <clears throat> sorry. So, uh, what is the point that that Derrida is making here? And I'll, I'll come back to uh, the relation of the humanities and the sciences. Uh, this is a related discussion, a uh, discussion which uh, like seems to be seems to me to be very important, uh, and and I I hope to to to. Uh, like link this discussion to to uh, the main main uh, point that I'm trying to make. So uh, what Derrida is trying to do here uh, in this uh, essay, which which has been produced from a lecture that he had um, earlier given, uh, uh, this is this is about uh, the turn of the century. 2002, probably the essay was published. Uh, the lecture was given in 99 or something like that. Uh, so, uh, uh, what uh, he is discussing here uh, is a um, is a certain problem, a certain uh, aporia in in thinking um, about the university. Uh, he talks about uh, a certain uh, unconditional freedom uh, within which the university uh, uh, is seen to operate. Uh, here, one has to be very careful because uh, one definitely knows that definitely in the real world, uh, there is no unconditional freedom uh, within which a university operates. Uh, what Derrida is talking here, uh, the notion of unconditionality that he's talking of here is in a way uh, which, which uh, someone who reads Derrida is, is very familiar with, but which one has to be careful to, to think of uh, the way uh, Derrida uh, talks about words like unconditionality, about justice, gift, uh, etc., like like these uh, line line of words, as uh, in their uh, almost a sort of a pure abstraction. So uh, Derrida's point would be: we know that these do not operate in a pure world. These always operate in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a hybrid world, in a world where, where the, the, the pure abstract notions uh, do not operate as such. But that doesn't mean that when one thinks of the world, when one thinks of the concept, uh, one uh, has to leave the purity of the concept. Rather, it becomes uh, important, it becomes uh, crucial to, to hold on to the purity of the concept, knowing fully well that that purity doesn't uh, operate. Uh, to, 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 to think of this, one, one may uh, think of the way, say, Derrida uh, talks about the notion of the gift uh, as, as in relation to uh, what he calls the economy. Uh, so, so when Derrida talks about gift and economy, he, he talks about the uh, notion of gift as uh, almost opposed to economy. Uh, economy where one would want to think of the gift uh, in terms of a giving and taking what the gift giving would entail uh, a certain receiving in a certain way. 
maybe not as a material uh, gift, uh, counter gift, uh, but as something which one gains, uh, maybe in terms of connections, in terms of uh, kinds and, and other things. And even Derrida is, is so careful here, he would say that to remember that one has given and to remember that one has received something is to already to work within an economy where one at least has that memory of giving or receiving. So the gift uh, per se would be something which is forgotten at the moment of the giving. So this gift is an impossible. So in that sense, in that way, one has to think of this unconditionality, the question of the unconditional. One doesn't mean by this that the university really uh, operates uh, with, within a certain, uh, within a, such a notion of uh, an unconditional freedom. But the point is, the idea of the university presupposes such an unconditional freedom. So the point is, in this, this, in this ideality, the university has to be able to utter the truth, uh, free from the bindings, uh, an unconditional freedom to operate it has to have. But it also has to be responsible to the outside, the society, economy, politics. How is this possible? Is it possible at all? And to remember that the truth that Derrida is talking of here is not only a constative truth, but also a performative. So it's not only like, again, I'm, I'm simplifying uh, almost, almost uh, uh, like mercilessly simplifying. Uh, like it's, it's not something, it's not a knowledge, a neutral fact, but also something which performs, produces a truth, a produces uh, an event in in uh, in a certain way. So the first point is that the university is defined by an unconditionality. Uh, this university demands and ought to be granted in principle besides what is called academic freedom, an unconditional freedom to question and to assert, or even going still further, the right to say publicly all that is required by research, knowledge, and thought concerning the truth. However enigmatic it may be, the reference to truth remains fundamental enough to be found, along with light on the symbolic insanities of many universities in, throughout the world practically. So, on the one hand, this, uh, and on the other, the, the, the placing, the positing of the university in, in, in a uh, certain topos. How to, how to think of these two together? Uh, and very interestingly, uh, there is a talks here also about how a certain virtualization, uh, certain a uh, politics of the virtual displaces this topology, this topology of where the university is situated. So uh, uh, just just to 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 uh, think of this uh, a little. Uh, in detail, uh, 
a, a politics of the virtual in the cyber space or cyber world uh, or in terms of what again derrida calls worldwideization which is something like but different from globalization where one is thinking of a sort of uh, a globalizing move but a globalizing in terms of the world not the abstract uh, uh, abstract uh, sphere of the globe but of the very real world so like he he talks of uh, uh, the, the the french word mondialization which we, I'm, i'm not going into that here but the point is uh the notion of the virtual the notion of the cyberspace what it does is it disturbs uh displaces in a certain way the notion of worlding per se the notion of what is to be uh in the world so and that notion of what is to be in the world is also a character of the university so what does this virtualization do to the uh, topos of the university and how i, I maybe maybe this this has like uh, tremendous possibilities probably when when one thinks of this in 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 a uh, webinar uh when one thinks of uh how uh the virtualization might displace uh, the topos of where one works uh and yet one has to be very careful one one cannot be uh, cannot be uh, like too quick in 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 making a uh a decision of of a uh, break uh, in making a uh, decision that there is a, a very uh, very uh, basic break operating here there is a break but there is also a certain continuity and and how uh, can one think of uh, that break and the continuity together that that's the the challenge that that one faces here so uh when one thinks of uh the unconditional uh, which is there in the university uh and the humanities as a place where the condition of unconditionality presents itself uh why humanities uh that's that's a different question but for now let us let us let us uh, take that into account and and uh, we will go into that just just a little later just uh, now uh, so to think of the humanities as a privileged place of presentation of this unconditionality uh and to think of how this may come at the cost of a certain ineffectivity a certain loss of effectivity because to be to have an unconditional access to truth is in some ways to lose the connections which would constrict condition that access but that would imply a certain ineffectivity in its relations to the world so the question then becomes is how to retain and produce the effect while being unconditional while presenting while being presented with the unconditional is it possible at all uh, <clears throat> one has to remember here that again in real terms what one calls unconditional here is not restricted to the humanities is not restricted to the university it 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 may operate 
beyond the humanities, beyond the university. It, it operates beyond the humanities, beyond the university. But it's a privileged uh, position of presentation which the humanities and the university provides to the unconditional. Um, as opposed to that, what one may think of the scientific here, very careful, like it doesn't mean that science works like this always. But here, the notion of the humanities and the notion of the scientific in the sense of a scientism, in the sense of a scientism where uh, science seems to rule, science seems to uh, posit itself as, as, the, as the reigning form of knowledge, as the uh, base form of knowledge. <clears throat> so to think of that science, one would then think in the freedom in terms of a sovereignty, not of the unconditionality. So, like, like this, I'm, 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 I'm positing this in a very simplified, uh, rough and ready manner. And one has to remember, I'm not really saying that these operate in fully in these ways, but a sort of a metaphorical use of the sciences, a metaphorical use of the humanities, where the humanities would be the preferred place of the unconditional and the sciences would be the preferred place of the sovereign. Both working for a certain freedom. But freedom, whether freedom in terms of the unconditional or freedom in terms of the sovereignty. Sovereignty, which would indicate uh, notions of fixity, notions of uh, a clear definition, notions of uh, a clear link to the power. I, 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 I cannot uh, go into the details here. I'm, I'm just laying out, out the, the uh, outlines. So if we now come back to the Sokal affair, what happens there is the experience of freedom is thought of in terms of a sovereignty, in terms of a surety, in terms of a projection from the present, not in terms of the unconditional, not in terms of what Derrida calls the experience of the perhaps, not in terms of an unanticipatability. So this involves, I would, I, would, I would end there, this involves what I would say, a mode of addressing the other, whether one tries to address the other or whether one tries to engulf the other in a sort of non-response. Therein lies the uh, relation and the non-relation of the humanities and the sciences. So uh, just, just to, to go back to that notion of the uh, as if and uh, uh, <clears throat> perhaps which, which, with which uh, I began. So as if is also not uh, surety totally, but as if means one is defining very clearly as if what? Giving away the notion of the perhaps which retains the unanticipatability of the humanities. So in a way, when one deals with the humanities, when one deals with the, uh, the, the, the working of the humanities in terms of the as if, in terms of surities, projections from the present, one really is going away from the from the call of the humanities, one, one, one might say. Uh, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll aim there. Thank you.
Thank you, Anirbandha. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, uh, and there can be many questions. I will uh, try to engage in a conversation with you and ask certain questions, which, uh, of course, have come in your discussion. But then uh, it can be unfolded uh, through the questions even more. One is uh, the question of uh, science. How, one thing is like science is appropriated in a certain way in scientism. But science is also, as a discourse, appropriated by uh, the social and political discourse. The social and political idiom, they also appropriate quote-unquote science uh, in a particular way. Sorry, my cam was off. Uh, the social and uh, political discourse also appropriate science in a particular way. For example, uh, Marxism, the discourse of Marxism uh, also uh, appropriate science in a certain particular way. It also talks about disenchantment and it claims to be scientific. We all know that uh, the discourse of uh, Marxism claims itself to be scientific. On one hand, it is like that. On the other hand, within we often forget the discourse of or the idea of uh, incalculable even within the discourse of science. For example, I give a con concrete example. I was reading uh, Derrida's uh, introduction to Husserl's Origins of Geometry. And there, uh, Derrida uh, clearly says that he has, he has uh, taken the word uh, undecidable from Kurt Gödel. Uh, we know about Kurt Gödel's uh, undecidability theory, but Derrida claims it to be, we, we quote and we refer undecidability again and again. But we often tend to forget that uh, Derrida himself claims to take it in certain ways and appropriate. Of course, he develops on it. It is definitely a performative concept now. It is not fixed as it has been defined by Kodl. But we often forget that within the discourse of science, it is very much there. So uh, on one hand, science appropriated by uh, so the discourse of science in a certain way in social and political discourse. On the other hand, the uh, idea of incalculable within the science is often forgotten when humanities people are discussing about science. So how would you address that? That is my first question. Please, uh, I think uh, we can ask the other questions later. Like, shall I respond to this? Like, shall I respond to this first? Uh, and then go into the other questions. And then go into the other questions. Yes, yes, or, or, the, please. Or, or, uh, see, definitely, this is uh, very important. Uh, and and this, uh, like the way I have uh, like laid out my my uh, points uh, today, uh, in uh, those terms, I think here uh, this would be. To uh, to be aware uh, that uh, the 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 way I was uh, talking about uh, that when one uh, thinks of this uh, uh, this uh, notion of the uh, unconditional or 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 or, or semi the uh, dynamic acting in the humanities. Uh, one has to remember uh, that uh, it doesn't only act in the humanities in very real terms. Here, one is talking about is a certain uh, is 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 a certain notion of the humanities uh, which is operative uh, in our thinking about the relations between the sciences and the humanities. So, like, one has to be very clear. Like, it's not that the humanities disciplines which are there are empirically they work uh, like according to this principle, or the uh, disciplines of science they empirically work 
according to the principles of like, of uh, what what we have called sovereignty but the humanities has a, a preferred position through which uh, this may work through which uh, uh, the unconditional may present itself and the sciences as a topos through which uh, the sovereignty uh, presents itself so uh, this is uh, like two a sort of abstracted notions about which we are talking of here but those abstractions like occur in very real relationships to the empirical so the moments of the empirical which go on to produce the generality called humanities the notion the moments of the empirical which go on to produce the generality called the sciences uh, there these may happen these may occur and these definitely not only may but these occur simultaneously the unconditionality and sovereignty uh, are unanticipatability and and a uh, sort of uh, fixity of a teleology they occur simultaneously but here we are thinking of in terms of uh, certain uh, principles which again are linked to the uh, moments so 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 um, these uh, are in terms of generalities that we were trying to think of uh, which have their own uh, singularities one 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 uh, may may very uh, importantly say so uh, that would be my 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 very initial response to this my, that this doesn't mean the, the, that empirical that they, they operate in, in the ways. thank you anirban this uh there are, i read one question from the chat box a question by professor anindra sen gupta uh he asked a question what role might imagination play in the aspired unconditionality of the humanity or is it it or it only an object of study how might it be different from the speculative or does it need to be different so the question is also there on your screen you can see uh -huh. uh, shall i repeat or but it is okay i don't know it, it's all right yeah i don't very interesting okay uh, again this is a huge question uh because uh like if one uh like uh, invokes kant here then imagination has a very uh, specific uh, uh, meaning hmm. uh, but the point is uh, whether uh, one is uh, like constrained uh, to be uh, to follow kant in 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 uh, so uh, very uh, like strict ways or Uh, whether one would uh, want to uh, think of imagination uh, also in ways which which uh, are more commonplace more uh, more commonplace less uh, uh, specialized so uh, like in 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 a certain way of thinking about imagination where imagination might be say Uh, opposed to uh, logic or to uh, concreteness uh, uh, concrete reality there uh, definitely imagination uh, would again be a, a preferred uh, space for uh, the working of unconditionality but one has to be very careful that imagination is not only that that is only a kind of a uh commonplace uh regular way of 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 thinking about imagination imagination uh, also holds within it possibilities of fixity 
possibilities of being uh, uh, defined in terms of uh, the, the the scientific in in uh, certain ways. Uh, so um, I think I I, I cannot really uh, uh, respond adequately to this question uh, just now, but uh, only point to the necessity to to uh, think about this uh, in our context uh, in a in a much more uh, variegated a uh, much more uh, uh, richer uh, dynamic so that would be my first response thank you uh on uh, devashish uh, professor banerji uh, do you want to ask any question if you have anything to ask. Thank you. Not really. I think it was a really fascinating talk. And uh, I could see a lot of uh, overlap and parallels. Uh, many points at which I resonated very much. And particularly your last question, Shamrat, I was also thinking about that with regard to the notion of undecidability and uh, unknowability within science. It's, it's one thing that we have to remember as, as uh, Anirban said about the generalities, you know, there is a historicity to science itself and the various moments that make up that historicity fall into the contest of the will for power which uh, is operating, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't belong to a certain point in time. It coexists. Uh, all the moments coexist in this moment as points of power, so to say. So that uh, the creation of this discourse of truth as, an, as a sovereign discourse is something that uh, generalizes over that particular area, while the notion of undecidability or unknowability becomes an esoteric truth within it. And uh, not even available to the way in which the will to power presents it to the general public, so to say. That kind of uh, uh, notion occurred to me while uh, Anirban was talking about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the the space or the topos of uh, humanities and sciences in the university. Uh, thank you, uh, Devasista. Very, very interesting comment. Uh, but uh, just uh, to conclude with one last question, uh, extending a lot, but then uh, that is about virtualization. Uh, this is a question to uh, Onirvanda, but Devashishda, if you like, you can also respond. That You know, we are talking about virtualization, the virtual world as a specific historical uh, political moment. Uh, but uh, this virtualization, virtualization of knowledge, which also implies a certain decontextualization. And decontextualization ha can have certain possibilities because, you know, on one hand, uh, decontextualization is something uh, which uh, can, again, recontextualize the thing, something which belongs to the other, to, to other spaces might be appropriated and reinterpreted. But uh, the problem which Anirvanda talked about, a virtualization, is also throwing uh, the uh, situation, the, the location of the university away, uh, the topology of the university away, and it creates a certain crisis of uh, uh, knowledge. But I was just thinking if this historical moment of virtualization also has its uh, genealogical precedents, like, you know, think of colonialism the way we have appropriated liberal humanist knowledge. And it is very important in case of the idea of scientific reason also. In our context, uh, totally decontextualizing it by through a certain modality of power. Through colonialism, we have absorbed and appropriated uh, the liberal humanist knowledge without contextualizing it uh, to the Europe. And we have universalized it in our context. So we, are we seeing... a uh, a uh, new manifestation of that in virtualization that we are discussing critical theory, we are thinking of Western uh, liberalism, and we are doing it virtually. And it is 
I don't know whether we are my students are connecting with it. Other speakers in here is connecting with it. So this connection also implies a certain distinction. So do you have anything to say about it, please? On Irvanda, then Devashish also. <clears throat> see, see, a very important thing, very important point that you, you made, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> uh, see, uh, uh, this uh, question of virtualization uh, appears here uh, in the context of uh, uh, what 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 uh, as, as I was talking about what uh, Derrida calls that worldwideization uh, uh, and and very interesting like I sometimes I, I, I while while talking in in class I I, I talk about how this whole uh, and, and uh, this is well known thing uh, but like Derrida here also talks about how and this whole notion of uh, like a uh, uh, sort of uh, what is commonly called globalization, uh, that sort of uh, producing uh, uh, connections around the uh, world, uh, uh, that has been talked very like um, very almost clairvoyantly like in, in Marx and Lenin, uh, uh, who were talking of how uh, like the whole uh, working of capital was leading towards a, like uh, a, a worldwideization. To, to. And the point is how what we like called here provisionally virtualization, how that affects this whole process, this whole process, where oh, like it's not only a uh, like making of connections, but also a making of hierarchies. Not only a uh, like making of uh, knowledge in a certain way, but also a making possible of workings of power in 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 certain very specific ways. The working of capital, the working of colonialism, uh, the working of uh, the other uh, forms of hierarchies. What the virtualization, how it displaces the workings uh, of, of uh, the relationships to the world. That is what is really very important and what one needs to study again, like in like some meticulous details and definitely there have been studies there have been important studies on this uh, but like what happens uh, at a at a at a conceptual level also like like uh, that is what 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 becomes very important at this point uh, so so i think uh, this is a very important uh, question that you raise uh, but again, like like which which we 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 cannot address here in in, 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 in uh, such a short discussion that will need uh, a very 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 detailed uh, discussion of of the uh, matters involved. And I, I think maybe like Devashista, if you want to say something more. Uh, not, not really. I think uh, yeah, I agree that yes, it, it is a it is a really important issue of our time, and uh, you know as you mentioned, it is a question of uh, you know completely you know uh, two levels: so one level of local knowledge and the other level of a making universal uh, that are uh, happening simultaneously. And in that sense, there is also a politics involved. There, there are all kinds of inequalities, but also a politics involved, uh, which is performative. And uh, I think that that entire area, it's, it's uh, again, as you mentioned, it, it really requires uh, consideration. And, you know, this, this, it requires deep consideration, I think. 
thanks both the speakers uh if uh pavel or mamata di you have some last word to say because there are many more questions but we cannot address all of them and uh, it is important uh, that you know uh, to let the speakers go because everybody has to uh, eat and sleep and uh, we are we are holding people another question is there to just a uh, short response hasn't humanity's deconstructed sovereign discourse of science in a mocking way the so called quacks like absurdity was also figured by rabale to mock at the scholastic tradition with methodologies any response i think yes the answer would be affirmative Ah, can't hear. Can't hear. Anirvanda cannot hear. Oh, oh, sorry, ah. sorry, sorry. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Ah. 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 Like, like, uh, I think the like, it, like, you. Uh, it's it's a very valid I point the, that you, you talk about. Uh, the the point, point is like talk about. Uh, hello. Hello. I I I I okay. like am I being heard? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I only would um, want to be a little uh, careful in using the term deconstruction, uh, like whether uh, to walk in a certain way and to deconstruct would be uh, like slightly different things, uh, slight but uh, crucial. Uh, so just keeping that in mind uh, one might say that uh, uh, like uh, these other figurings of uh, uh, scientific mode of uh, working uh, those might be important in uh, a deconstruction of of the relations between Uh, science and humanities definitely i i i agree to that thank you yeah thank you. so i thank uh, professor anirvan das and professor devashish banerjee uh, pavel would you like to say something pavel yeah pavel has left i don't know there's some technical problem to be you join back Uh, Mamata Di, Mamata Di, you want to say something? Switch on the mic and say. Mamata Di, you say something. Mic turn, cut the habit. Mic turn, cut the habit. Mic turn. Okay, there there is some problem with the connection. Mamata Di, we can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, Pavel, you say something then. The last word. Then we, then we can end the discussion. Uh, actually, I I want to. Uh, actually, I I want to. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, Sharmada, can you mute your your mic? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't have any question uh, as of now, but I just want to uh, thank both the speakers, and I have been enlightened in many ways. Uh, by their speeches and i hope they will come back on this platform again when we uh, invite them again uh, thank you uh thanks everyone thanks mamata di you were present there uh, you joined later also in the stream yard we couldn't listen to you but definitely we'll talk later uh, uh, it's unfortunate thank you all the speakers so we break here uh end of today's discussion tomorrow we have a session from 6 to 8 uh so you if you wish to join you can we'll send you the youtube link thank you so goodbye to everyone many many thanks for making it a success thank you thank you shomrat thank you shomrat thank you thank you yeah it was a great session <laughs>